Hello. Today is April 24th, 2007. We're at the home of Mr. James Goodrich at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans Oral History Program. Thank you for participating, Mr. Goodrich, today, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Let's start out with, if we can, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, when and where you were born. Uh, born in Salem, Oregon, on the 15th of February, 24. And I don't remember ever seeing my dad. My mom died when I was six. So I spent most of my life growing up in an orphanage in Seattle. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think I was 16 when these people took me out of the orphanage and I lived with them for two years. And he was a principal of the high school in Issaquah, Washington. And she was a substitute teacher. But uh, I didn't like school very much, so my junior year I decided I wasn't going to finish it. So he gave up his summer vacation to get me a job as an apprentice molder in the foundry where he used to work. I thought that was pretty darn nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I stayed there in Everett at the foundry for two years, I think. I was 16, yeah. And I went down and tried to join the Marines. They found out I had asthma, so they said, no way. Now, had the war broke, already broke out when you tried to join the Marines, or was this oh, before yeah, the war? Oh, yeah, this was in 42. Oh, okay. Do you remember, let's back up just a little bit. Do uh, you remember where you were and what you were thinking when, when you heard Pearl Harbor was bombed? I was in Everett. I don't remember just where I was. I might have been at work or something. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, I didn't think much about it right then. Yeah. And then later I tried to join the Marines, like I said, they wouldn't take me. And then I went over to the Navy and figured, heck, they'd take me, put me out on a boat, you know, and I wouldn't be bothered with it. No, they wouldn't take me. Once again, because of your asthma? So I waited around, my asthma wasn't bothering me in October. So I went down November the 2nd and joined the Army Air Corps. <laughs> And uh, they didn't know I had asthma because it wasn't bothering me. So they, Fort Lewis, Washington is where I was indoctrinated. And uh, they sent me to basic training. I'd let you guess where. Miami Beach. <laughs> From up here. Yeah. To here, just as far as they could get me. Yeah. Anyway, we lived in those nice hotels. We did our drill stuff out on the golf course. And I was there just, I think, four or five weeks. And uh, they wanted us to go to technical school, they call it. So I picked armament. You had a choice? Oh, if, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, they sent me from Miami Beach, I think it was in January, to Denver, Colorado. And talk about a difference. Yeah. Anyway, it was at Buckley Field, I went through armament school. And I think the first thing they taught us was how to synchronize a machine gun to fire through a prop. And they had got away from that by then anyway. I don't know why we had to learn that. Hmm. Anyway, I graduated from there and I asked to go to gunnery school. So down back south to Harlingen, Texas. And two weeks before I graduated, they were giving out staff sergeant to everybody graduated from gunnery school. And they cut it back to Buck Sergeant when I graduated. <laughs> so, ah, well, it was all right. 
And then they sent me to, from there to Salt Lake City for, uh, to transfer to a different place, I guess. We were stationed in the old uh, fairground, big old building there. And that's where they found out I had my eyes on. <laughs> Went to medical stuff one morning, wheezed a little bit. And the doctor says, you got two choices. You be discharged, medical discharge, or we can send you somewhere as a gunnery instructor. I said, well, I want to stay in. So they sent me to Camp Seven Mile in Spokane, Washington, as huh. a gunnery instructor. That's where I met my brother. Well, he was adopted. I, he adopted, his family adopted me when okay. I was 20 years old. Your biological brother? No. Oh, oh adopted, okay. Yeah, he was, we met at the skating rink and just started running around together. And first thing huh. I knew, they adopted me. I'll be done. So, anyway, I uh, left there and went to Rapid City for another gunnery instructor place. And we just put in a lot of time there in B-17s. I thought, oh boy, if I ever get sent anywhere, I'll get to fly a 17 or be in it. No, they asked for volunteers to go overseas. That's when I volunteered. And somewhere they'd lost my medical records, so they didn't know I was grounded. <laughs> anyway, they we went from there to New Orleans. We were, barracks was an old banana warehouse. Uh. And we'd swim across the river and go get beer and come back with it. <laughs> Until they found out there were barracudas in there. <laughs> so we could swim. And... But it was a lot of fun. Uh. <clears throat> then I went to Panama. Let's see if I can tell you just when. Panama on 6th of August, 1944. And Once uh, again, as a gunnery instructor, or by this time were you... I was uh, back in flying status, because okay. they'd lost my paper somewhere. Uh -huh. yeah, I was flying B-24s out of Panama, Rio Hata, and David, two air bases we were at. But... Uh, there weren't no guns on the ships, no bombs. All we did was fly out over the ocean. If we spotted anything unusual, we'd call the Navy, and they'd go check it out. So I figured my time was just about spent doing nothing down there. What What was the whole purpose of me down there? To, what to protect the canal, or uh, yeah. okay, uh huh? Yeah, they had. Uh, bunch of fighters down there, I mean, all along that canal. And nobody could get near the darn thing. I mean, planes, ships, or anything without checking through. Mm -hmm. So then I was there until February of 45. And they sent me back. And, uh, let's see. Oh well, yeah, I came back and had a furlough of 30 days. So I went back to Spokane, spent my 30 days there. Then they sent me to I'm not sure. <laughs> oh yeah, I went back I went to San um, Amarillo. That's all, a whole bunch of, everybody there was returnees, they called them. They'd all been overseas. Okay. Waiting for discharge. I didn't have enough points to get discharged, so I re-enlisted. And that's when they sent me to Denver to go through B-29 school at Lowry. 
And uh, I thought, oh boy, graduate out of here, I'll get to go over in the Pacific, you know. Graduated out of there, and they sent me to Kearns, Utah, for waiting for shipping orders. I guess they called it the Redistribution Center or something like that. So next thing I know, I'm in Santa Ana, California, waiting to go overseas, and I end up in Hawaii, in Wheeler Field. Huh. And that's where they put me in the night fighter squadron. Made a radar operator out of me, and I trained to be a B-29 gunnery. How did you get in? How did you get into the radar? I mean, why? They asked all of us on flying status if we wanted to start flying again, and if they did, we'd have to learn the radar. So, oh, okay. Uh, wasn't much to it back then, you know. Yeah. But that was the only ship that was made, or a plane, that was made around radar. And uh, most of our stuff was at night. But anyway, after that, we went from there to Japan. And let's see. So I take it that when you say you went to Japan, the war was over by now, yeah. and you were uh, part of the occupation force? Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, I'll find it here somewhere. <clears throat> oh, that ain't good. I can't get all my paper right. Well, that's okay. That's fine. Yep. Anyway, I was in uh, APTO, 9th of April, 46. That's when I went to Japan. Okay. That was, what, five months after the... Oh, we thought we got there just two or three weeks after, but uh, I looked on here in April. So I stayed there until February of 47. And I came back and got discharged at Camp Beale, California. And that was about it. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a little bit about, I, I imagine uh, growing up, you didn't travel too much far away from where you grew up there in Washington. What was it like to crisscross across the country at various places? and? Then, uh, then oh, exotic places like Panama, Hawaii, Japan. Talk a little bit about your travels. Oh, uh, well, they just boat rides and airplane. But I mean, uh, Panama was one of the hot places I ever been, and it rained two or three times a day, so <laughs> it was hot and muggy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we were out in the middle of the boondocks, or whatever you want to call them, down there. And uh, the nearest town was 20 miles away, and it was just a little bitty shacks. It was a mess. Yeah. Then when I went to Hawaii, it was hot too, but all the time it was about normal, 78, 80. But I didn't really enjoy Hawaii. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I don't think they wanted us over there at the time. This was right after the war ended. Yeah. So when I went to Japan, uh, I think that's one of the nicest places I've ever been. Is that right? Yeah. What part of Japan were you stationed? Atsugi and Yokota. I don't know. They're just Atsugi is about, I think. 40 miles out of Tokyo, 
and that sugi is about the same with different location. You coat it rather. So, what was uh, what was Japan like uh, at that point, and how how were the the, the, the Japanese people, towards you? And oh, they were just as friendly as they could be. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And they'd do anything for you. And we had uh, that bottom picture, mom. We had a. Uh, some of the Japanese men, they come in and took care of the barracks. We didn't have to do a thing, that was something. Yeah. And uh, What I'll do is at the end of the interview, we'll, we'll, we'll film all, yeah. everything you want on the tape. I just, but, uh, this, I, just, I take it was painted by a Japanese artist? An artist, yeah, yeah he painted it while he sat there. Huh. And, <laughs> anyway, they, they had him doing everything. We had, some of the women in the mess hall, and uh, but the Japanese people themselves were just about as nice as they could be. Hmm. And the country itself, we flew all over. You know, it was really nice country, and beautiful. You know, how they made gardens on the side of the hills the way they did was something else. Huh. They'd level off a little spot. Make a garden, level off another one, just stair step the whole way down. Uh, what was your duty? What were your duties in Japan? What were you? I'm just flying in that P61 radar operator. And and the reason to, to fly around was uh, any just to keep in practice, I guess. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. And uh, did did it uh, flying affect your asthma at all, or uh, no? No. And was there any particular location that you traveled around that was better or worse for your asthma? That, uh, well, I, the only place that bothered me, I think, was in Salt Lake when I was there. But uh, no, it didn't bother me any during the service. It sure did after I got out, didn't it? Uh, uh. So. Well, once again, too, I, I imagine growing up, uh, You'd never had a chance to fly in an airplane. What was your first airplane ride like? Do you remember oh, that? It was fun. That was a old AT6 two-seater training plane. What we flew in gunnery school, and they had another ship out there dragging the target. And that's what we shot at. Was it? Uh. So different people had different colored bullets. So when they went through the target, they would be able to recognize it, and they just—it was really fun. Yeah, I, I liked it. <laughs> well, when you—I'm when you, uh, backing up here with various questions, yeah. but when you—you uh, you said when you first tried to enlist, you—you you tried to enlist in the Marines. Why did you choose them over the other services? Was it there just sounded like a better place to go? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Please. He wanted to be a pilot. Oh, yeah. I got out of gunnery school and they asked us if anybody wants to go to uh, cadet training. I said, yeah, I'd like to go. So I got everything was ready. Went down to medical oh. and they found out I couldn't turn my right hand over. Oh, is that right? And they said, you can't go. Uh. Just for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd like to have been a pilot. No way. Yeah, yeah. So you uh, uh, went, were in the service till '47, and it was discharged uh, out in California. You said. Yeah, uh, Camp Beale. Yeah. You want to continue your story where you went from there, and and uh, a little bit about your life after the service, and. Well, let's see if I can remember. Went back to Spokane. I drove a produce truck for a little over a year, I think. Uh, hauling produce out of Spokane into Montana. So my brother worked there too, same outfit. And uh, was it hard finding a job uh, with all the servicemen coming back and and such? Uh, yeah, at that time? it took a little while to find yeah. it, but uh, they 
it didn't work too good. I mean, never, it wasn't what I wanted, really. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, tried everything else. Worked in a logging camp, a lumber mill, and what else? Did you was back in the service when I met you. Yeah, I was re-enlisted in '49, I think it was, and uh, only two years then. So I was in San Antonio in uh, ammunition supply squadron. I don't remember just what it was. And then when I got out of there, I went. Got married. That's a heck of a thing, you know, just right after. <laughs> uh, yeah, 1949 or 50 when I got out. And we got married in July of 50. You met down in Texas? Yeah. And then we went to Spokane, didn't we, Mom? For a while, and my brother was working at Kaiser Aluminum, so he got me on out there. I didn't like that at all. So her dad told us that I could get a job at Hughes Tool Company in Houston. And uh, they didn't pay very much, but uh, uh, What do you call it? Uh, veterans Affair. Paid so much on top of that so a guy could make a living. Okay, uh huh. I was learning machinist work. That's what I always wanted. Uh, you're, uh, was this part of the GI Bill? Or? Yeah. Okay, uh huh. And uh, I stayed there for a while. I don't know, it wasn't too long. But it was, uh, it was a union shop. And if you did too many parts, they'd kick you out of there. <laughs> you had to do just a certain amount and then go hide somewhere. I didn't like that very well. So I got out of that and then I started doing all kinds of different work until I found what I wanted. But I drove delivery truck, drove over the road truck everything else. I finally got into a machine shop and uh, I think it was 53 or 54 and took an apprenticeship in the machine shop and tool and die work. After I got out of there they sold out to a place up in northeast somewhere. I didn't want to go up there, so I went to work for the guy that had been the engineer. He started up his own shop. And two weeks after I went to work for him, I was his foreman. Hmm. I stayed there four years, and you know, him and I had a little disagreement, so I left. And. Uh, and I went to work for some little aluminum shop. We took over the machine shop in there and run it. And then this guy that I worked for after that, he come over there and offered me a dollar and a half more an hour to come to work for him. So I did. I went and worked for him for four years. And we moved up here in Denver in 1970. Because of his asthma. Yeah. Oh, okay. And doctor told me move or die, so we moved. Hmm. Houston was no good for that. Yeah. My wife used to give me adrenaline shots at night so I could sleep a little bit. Hmm. And uh, anyway, I went to work for this guy. And Stayed four years and we moved up to 70. And I worked in a place in Denver until December of that year. 
two weeks before Christmas, they laid nine of us off. Mm. And I had four children with us, wasn't it? Four? Yeah. I couldn't afford to just sit around, so the guy I worked for in Texas called and offered me a money to come back down there if I go back to work for him. So I did. And I worked there until 74. All the kids were out of school. I said, that's it, I'm going back to Denver. So I went back up here and went to work for the same outfit as the <laughs> later saw. Come to find out, they hired them all back in January. Oh, jeez. I was in Denver, Texas by then. So I worked there for two or three years, I guess. And uh, the foreman in the southern plant asked me if I wanted to come work over there. I said, yeah. Paid more, better hours, everything. So I went to work for Tools for Bending. I stayed there until 86 when I retired. But that was one of the best places I ever worked in my life. Yeah. You know, I go back there now anytime I'm in Denver and go see everybody. But the owner passed away, what was it, last year? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, his son runs it now. But still have a lot of the people that I used to work with there. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And that's about it until, you know, we just decided to, couldn't take care of the house anymore in Denver and sure. moved up here. Sure. Yeah. What's it been, three years? Yeah. yeah. Forty. Oh four. Yeah. Okay. January of oh four we moved up here. Mm -hmm. So we've been up here. That was a good move. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We love it here. Yeah, good. Mom okay. says she ain't moved again. <laughs> <laughs> three daughters here. Oh okay. So we got it made pretty good here. Yeah. And uh the Kids and the grandkids are taking us to Washington D.C. next month. That's what Donna said to see the yeah. uh, Air Force Memorial and, and uh, all such. World War II. Well, yeah, that was just finished last year, I believe. Mm -hmm. Do you keep in touch with any of your old buddies from uh, from the sure. war years? Uh, I I wasn't in a, the only group I was really in was in Panama, and uh, well in. Japan too, but no, I don't remember any of them. Really. Yeah, they yeah. were just just a bunch of guys you worked with. Yeah, yeah. So by and large, every time you made a move, you were moving. You didn't move as a unit. You were always moving kind of alone, or uh... well, I moved alone most of the time. But yeah. then, uh, when we was in Hawaii, our whole group went to Japan. So. I remember that pilot I had, he was our CO. I think he was a lieutenant colonel, a young guy. But <laughs> he scared me to pieces one time. It was that old plane, you could it'd fly over 400 miles an hour, or you could drop the wheels and the wing, uh, aileron, you know, and it'd slow down to 100 and something. So he was up there, he says, I'm going to try this, Jim. He put one wingtip down in Mount Fuji and around we went. Huh. Oh, man, I, I got back, I think I slid all the way to the barracks. <laughs> <laughs> it was really something. And then he went out in uh, Tokyo Bay and these little fishing junks all over, you know. He'd fly so low that you'd see the prop oars from both props. And he'd come up behind one of the boats up over it and back down and he'd like to tip them over. Uh -huh. And he just enjoyed it, I guess, doing that. I don't think the Japanese enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> it was really something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Have you had a chance to ever go back to Panama or Japan? To, to where, uh, no. Yeah. Too busy raising kids. Yeah, yeah. So, 
But we traveled quite a bit while we was raising the kids. We lived in Houston 25 years. And every other year or something, we'd go to Spokane and see the folks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we moved to Denver. We, Dad died in 69, I believe it was. A year after your dad died, yeah. And then mom passed away, I don't remember when, but we haven't been up there in a long time now. And, and you chose to, uh, part of it was your health, but uh, uh, Colorado because of your time in Buckley, uh, did that uh, play into your decision at all? Well, or? Yeah, in a way I guess it did really. Yeah. Cause, uh, I liked it here so much the two times I was here that we just decided to come back. And I don't know, it was just one of them things. Yeah, yeah. The doctor down there told me either move or die, so I moved. Sure, yeah. And he didn't die yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but I'm looking at it. Yeah. If you'd have seen me back in no, uh, January, you'd have thought. Uh, uh, I lost, what, 20 pounds? 22. 22 pounds. Couldn't eat nothing. Uh, Just wouldn't go down. If it did, it'd come back up. Uh, and they finally started feeding me through a tube, so I got my strength back. nose. <laughs> Well, is there any other stories that that I didn't ask or any questions didn't ask you? Is there anything you wanted to talk about or Mrs. Goodrich, any stories that he's told over the years that you remember that he's left out that uh, we can add to the to the tape that... Uh... Well, I remember him saying something about an iguana. Oh, yeah. In <laughs> Panama. Panama. I was coming home one night, me and a couple other guys, back to the base, and here's the thing. Looked like Godzilla, really. We got up there to it, and there's a big old iguana. He's sitting on his tail, picking leaves out of the tree. Uh, it, I think he's about oh, five, six foot long. They get big down there. Yeah. I thought, I don't know if you want to see these or not. That's just for crossing the equator. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Now, how was that? How was that? Uh, you know, growing up in eastern Washington, uh, I don't imagine you've ever been on the ocean. Did you get your sea legs, or how was how was the the crossings across the Pacific for you on uh, ships? You, you crossed ships, correct? Or, yeah. 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 No. Uh, no problems there. And no. Uh, yeah. It, a lot of the guys got sick as could be, but yeah, I guess. Flying and that's about the same, so it didn't, yeah, yeah. didn't bother me. Well, what would you guys do for uh, for like entertainment? Like you said, down in Panama, there was not a whole lot going on when you weren't flying, and, and the, the long movie. distance of the on the ships. What uh, what would you guys do for for fun and entertainment? To... Well, on the ship, everybody I think was playing poker, but uh, at the bases, we'd go into these little towns. And, Drink and mess around like everybody else. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was not much to do outside of the service club. Yeah. So, I want to ask you about this. I've talked to quite a few veterans, and I've never seen one that had one of those. Maybe you've seen them before. Boy, I hadn't. From Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. Huh. Well, my name was Maury while I was in the service. I was adopted to Goodrich. Gotcha, okay. Uh-huh. Huh. huh. Well, uh, 
there's anything else that you can think of, uh, any uh, last stories or closing comments you'd like to make before we kind of wind down the interview? No, just, I think I went to 14 schools in 11 years when I was in the orphanage. Yeah. People would take you out and yeah. keep you for a little while and send you back. Uh, Farm him out. Huh? Farm you out. Yeah, well, that's what they did, actually. So, but that was a good ex education, I think. Yeah. Moving around like that. When I went in the service. It probably made it easier for you when you're in the service than a lot of guys. Uh, oh, yeah, because yeah. I was used to saying yes, sir, no, sir, and yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yeah. Got in the service, same thing. Yeah. I think it helped a lot just learning those things. Yeah. Uh, you learn pretty quick, too. <laughs> when I first went in there, this matron, I'm calling, told me to do something. I said, okay, and about that time I hit the floor. She said, you will say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and yes, sir, and no, sir. I never had any more problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they didn't take no job. Mm -hmm. uh, Nowadays they'd have them in jail for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so your upbringing uh, in the orphanage and stuff made it probably an easy transition into the military. How was your, how was the transition leaving the military back in civilian life? Was that much of a, an issue for you? Or, uh, well, it was quite a bit of a change and Really, there weren't many jobs, so that's one reason I went back in the service again. And by that time, it was now the, the Air Force. It was separated from the Army? It, uh, yeah, yeah, that uh -huh. was in 47. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, I think it was right after I got out, not too long. I got out. look all the papers soon. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was uh, U.S. Air Force after that. Right, right. So. Okay. Well, we'll wind down this uh, this interview uh, and then we'll, we'll photograph whatever, uh, get some uh, pictures on the tape as well. Um, okay. I wanted to thank you for participating in this project. Uh, more importantly though, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Okay, this is a picture of me in 1943. I was in Spokane at the time. And uh, my mother wanted a picture, so I got this one made. Uh, this picture was painted by a Japanese artist in Atsugi Air Base in 1946. This is a plane I flew in Panama, a B-24, Miss Night Mission. Miss Night Mission was her name? Yeah. Yeah, this is a P-61 Black Widow Night Fighter. It was the only ship built with a, a round the radar unit. And this is the one you flew in Japan? Yeah. Okay. Hawaii and Japan both. Uh-huh. And I sat in the back here. Uh, back right here, yeah. okay. Uh huh. And uh, pilot was up in the front. And you uh, fa you faced backwards then, or uh, no? Face forward. Yeah. yeah. I could swivel around with oh, okay. the gun in the back. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. So it was uh, a lot of fun flying in them things. Yeah. Alrighty.